Hello, everyone. Looks like we're finally live now. Thanks, everyone, to, for coming to our event. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the, the future of human interactions. Uh, and we've got Romy and Sophie and myself. I'm Robert uh, here to talk to you today. And I'm just going to hand it over to Sophie. And she's going to give us a bit of an introduction and tell us what we're talking about. Well, thanks, Rob. Uh yeah, so basically how we're going to just start is um, by doing a quick overview of each of our projects that we've done as part of the Global Innovation Design Masters um, at, at the Royal College of Art. And this will kind of just act as a way to give you an insight to some of our perspectives um, that we each have on this topic of um, humanizing technology and kind of more than human design. Um, and so all of our projects on the surface look quite different, but um, actually when you get down to kind of the heart of them, they each address each of these issues of how humans interact with the environment and how do we design those interactions um, as the kind of middle point between these two entities, I guess. Um, so how we'll start is I'll do a quick introduction to my projects in Sora, which is looking at um, really how do you design uh, the human perception of environments and how can you um, reimagine how those perceptions take place in order to create a more inclusive future. Um, then Rob will talk about his project MIMO, which is really looking at the um, kind of middle point of these interactions between humans and nature and looking at the interplay of this relationship from both perspectives. Um, and that MIMO is essentially um, using uh, nature as an interface for technology. Then uh, Romy will do a quick introduction as well to her project, uh, Symbiotic Futures. And this really looks at this relationship from nature's perspective, thinking how can we reconnect humans with nature for a more sustainable future? Um, so to begin, hi, I'm Sophie again. Uh, and we'll have all the uh, contact information as well at the end. Um, so if you want to get in touch with us afterwards, you can do that um, in a more easy way in the chat. Um, but I'll quickly do a quick brief introduction to my project, Sensora, which um, is really looking at um, creating an inclusive design solution to how blind and partially sighted people can navigate the world beyond vision. Um, and so this really started with a quote from a user who I met when I was doing my research um, to begin with, thinking um, how, who said that we're only disabled by the design of our environment. And for me, I felt like this was quite a sort of powerful statement in terms of um, actually, you know, if we are, if the design of our environment has the power to sort of enable or disable all of us, can we redesign the entire environment? Um, and kind of looking at this perspective of points of intervention into the problem of navigation and how we access information in the world, um, actually designing the entire environment is a really unfeasible and um, kind of, unrealistic solution, but more easily we can design our perception of the environment and how we sort of perceive different types of information and experience that information. Um, and so really looking at a lot of types of, um, uh, sorry, uh, products that exist already on the market, uh, there are a lot of current assistive technologies that look at how you can enable um, different types of navigation for blind and partially sighted users, but there's a real dominance actually on the detection of that information and using technology as a way to um, decode the visual information in the environment. But actually what my project really looked at was if you have all this information and you have um, all the content needed to allow someone to um, navigate the world in this way, how what is the experience that you are creating? And really that's the kind of point that my project really focuses on is this experience from the user and very human-centered approach to this problem. Um, and so throughout the design process, I really wanted to integrate a lot of user perspectives um, to work very closely with users themselves. And this was some photos from um, the, a focus group that I run at Thomas Pocklington Trust in London, pre-COVID times. Um, and this was really a great opportunity to hear firsthand from users um, the real problems that are needed for hands-free, non-visual ways to navigate. Um, and the design process itself as well looked across a, a huge variety of different disciplines, looking at everything from the kind of neuropsychology of the research process, looking at developing the spatial audio um, needed to create this experience, and then looking at how you can communicate that through the hardware itself um, and the design of the form and the kind of product. 
Um, and so the final product um, is a kind of wearable technology. Um, and I think the interesting point that I found as I started to develop the project um, throughout the kind of latter ends of the uh, project development was really speaking to a lot of people outside of um, just the sort of users who were blind and partially sighted and actually looking at other disciplines where this can affect and looking at it as a, an inclusive design solution um, for other areas where you might want to navigate um, non-visually. So for example, with uh, firefighter centering a burning building um, was one of the examples. But I think, yeah, this is just kind of a brief overview and you can see more of the work at the uh, RCA 2020 show that's still on, but um, hopefully that gives you a bit of an insight. Um, and now we'll move on to Rob. Well, thanks, Sophie. Um, just before I start, I can hear a bunch of birds outside my window. If you can hear them too and they're distracting, just type something in the chat. I'll uh, I'll close up my window in a second here. But my project is uh, is Mimo, as Sophie introduced it, and it's this interface uh, for it's a computer interface that uses a mimosa pudica plant uh, as the touching surface. And so what's special about this plant, the mimosa pudica, it's sometimes called the shy plant, is that it has this beautiful response where if you touch its leaves, it will fold up. And you can see it in the pictures here. It's kind of like a Venus flytrap if you haven't heard of, of a mimosa before, but um, it, it doesn't do this for, uh, for predatory reasons. It's not trying to eat a fly or anything like that. It just does it to protect itself from predation. Um, and I thought, I saw this plant and I thought, you know, this is such a beautiful response that it, it, it's giving you feedback and it's, it could be a form, a mechanism of user feedback. And the pictures here don't quite do it justice. When you tap on the leaf, the little leaflets all fold up sort of one after the other like this in this beautiful cascade. Um, and so what I did uh, is I created a device around that plant. And so MIMO is obviously shorthand for Mimosa pudica. And the way this device works is it's got a probe. You can see a small wire there that goes into the soil. And it uses a technology called swept frequency capacitive sensing. Uh, basically, when you touch the plant, you capacitively couple with the plant. You electrically couple with the plant. And then the device can detect that presence. Um, and so what you might do with MIMO is that you could use it to control, say, smart lights around your house, turn your lights on and off, play or pause your music. It can be programmed to do any sort of interaction like that. But it's it's basically a response to very boring designs that have always been with us. The designs of light switches and buttons, the things that we don't really think about they're very simple interactions, but they don't necessarily lend value to our lives. They're not necessarily interesting. And so the point behind MIMO is to bring those interactions from the background into the foreground, make them interesting and, and make them worthwhile in their own right. Um, and so this brings us to the point of interactions, they shouldn't just be a means to an end. They can actually be an experience in and of themselves. And that's been a theme in my work here. And so there's another aspect of MIMO, which is pretty interesting, which I'll just highlight here. And that's the, the grow light. So MIMO has a very special custom grow light that uses four wavelengths of light to manipulate the, the growth and behavior of the plant as well. So it uses uh, white light, blue light, red light, and far red light. Far red light is like really red. It's so red that it's almost invisible. And what that does is if you're using this to control the lights in your house, one of the things that uh, that mimosa pudicas will do is they close up in the dark because they don't need to be open. Um, but if you shine briefly far red light on it, this almost invisible red light, the plant will stay open. And so you can continue to use it for interactions. And then the other wavelengths of light can manipulate the growth of the plant to be kind of taller and skinnier or, or bushier and wider, uh, depending on just your preference or how the plant is growing at the time. And so here's sort of an overview of, of what the plant, uh, what MIMO looks like on the inside. And, and it was a, a joy to work on this. It's all got these uh, custom electronics and I got a chance to, to learn all about how to do that. So that's MIMO um, and I'll pass it over to Romy. Um, you probably couldn't hear me, so I hope that you can hear me now. Um, thank you very much, Rob. 
Uh, my project is called Symbiotic Futures. My name is Romy Snijders and I have a background in uh, industrial design from the Delft University of Technology. And um, my project uh, on the next slide um, started with the problem that uh, the disconnection of humans and the rest of nature is contributing to our planets and our own destruction. Because I did a lot of research into climate crisis and into the way we're currently living and I found out all these really interesting things about the past and about connections to nature. And so my project is about a future vision in which we live in harmony and in symbiosis with nature. And on the next slide, um, you can see what this might look like. And um, it shows this future vision of the Netherlands in 2035 and a forester which is interacting with tools and with trees and trying to understand the language of nature through these interactions. And uh, on the next slide, um, we can see that um, trees communicate with each other through mycorrhizal fungi. And so um, this is what I found super interesting. And during my project, I dived into this um, because I think it's very fascinating that, um, that this is happening. I didn't know about this. And so trees can, for example, warn each other for an affect attack. They can send each other nutrients and one tree can be for example connected to 47 other trees which i find very fascinating so based on this um i designed this future and on the next slide we can see a forester and um in this future foresters will be the sort of front line of exploring this language to try to improve environmental health because these microbial fungi and this communication between trees can tell us something about the environmental well-being and about um, what might we improve, like they can be used as bioindicators. And on the next slide, we can see the tools. So the tool on the left is looking at which trees are connect connected and whether they are sending or receiving information. And the right tool taps into the microrhizal mycelium hotspot and translates the communication into a soundscape that can be heard and recorded and be compared over time. And in the first place, this will be done by the foresters. And then on the next slide, you can see um, how this interaction would work, like how the tools together would look like and how the tool would be tapped into the microrhizal mycelium network. Um, this was just an insight, and I would love to tell you more about it, but let's get back to Rob. So thanks, Romy. Um, just before we start, I just want to make a, a note about the chat. So please feel free to ask us any questions. We'll be having a look at the chat, and we'll try to, to answer your questions as they come up. Um, but I'll open up the conversation here by asking Romy, uh, what elements do you think are essential for humanizing technology? Um, I think that um, it's super essential, first of all, to look really into human behavior, natural human interactions, and uh, to look at empathy and empathizing with other humans and with other uh, technologies and other beings. But what is really important in my project as well is not just to look at humans, uh, but also to look at other beings. And that is where the more than human design comes in because uh, I think technologies should not just be focused on how it might make human life better, but how it might make all life better. And then um, how we can, or how technology can facilitate this improvement of life and improvement of the future. Just to expand on that a little bit, you say that technology should be focused or design and technology should be focused on improving the lot for all life. Is the the is that um, the end in and of itself that you want to improve uh, the lot of all life or is that to improve uh, life for humans? So, for example, if you can treat nature uh, respectfully um, and live sustainably, that helps humans in the long run. So is the goal to help humans or help nature in and of itself? Um, my goal is definitely to improve all life, but I definitely think that in this way it also improves humans' lives. And uh, I guess since we can mostly understand humans and not that much about other life, um, that that is the best that we can do. 
in our understanding. Um, but I think that um, we can definitely empathize a lot more with other beings. Awesome. Thanks, Romy. Um, and I'll talk to Sophie now, ask Sophie a question. So Sophie, you just gave us a wonderful overview of Sensora, uh, this beautiful technology to help help impaired people see. Um, so in your view, what does an inclusive future look like for design? I mean, great question. Um, I mean, I think for me, the biggest thing that um, I feel like there needs to be a sort of shift in attitudes moving forwards would be more about the kind of assumptions that people make um, and about kind of looking at designing a future and actually how human bias, our own individual human bias plays into what we design. And I think that, I mean, that that's kind of been a lot of big conversation around AI, but I think it's true for everything that we do. And I think we can't assume that we know, um, in a way similar to what Remy's saying about kind of designing for nature but actually designing for other humans I guess is what where I'm coming from but more about kind of you can't place your own bias onto someone else and you have to actually engage different perspectives into the conversation while you're designing to bring a kind of overview of um, the different sort of elements that you need to address and understand and actually moving forwards I think that would be the biggest thing for me that I, I'm trying to look more towards and bring in more into my work um, would be about this kind of diversity in, in people who are um, at the decision-making level um, and bringing more people into the conversation, almost democratizing the conversation and the levels, the kind of entry to level of getting into these conversations so that you can actually bring more people into it um, and yeah, get a, get a wider perspective on actually what, what needs addressing. So Thanks for that. Uh, you had, during Sensora, I, I remember you had a very intensive um, process of gathering information and talking to people who, who had different levels of impairment. And you, you carried that all through the process uh, of designing Sensora. Can you tell us sort of in practical terms what you did to bring this to life and, and how you went out and talked to people? Yeah, I mean, so the project actually, and some sort of shape or form started about a year and a half ago when I did my first um, kind of solo project in GID. Um, and that was working with blind and partial sighted users. And what the project I did was not particularly great, um, but it was a, a, when I started kind of becoming interested in this area and I continued it, I felt like there was something interesting there. And so I kind of continued the conversation as we went to Tokyo, New York um, and continued meeting different people and developing those conversations and actually realizing that the real issue that I was trying to address that kept coming to the forefront was this, was this idea of kind of independent travel um, and actually that being something that was being experienced by all of the users that I met globally um, and kind of that started just as kind of individual conversations and then um, when I came back to London I ran the focus group um, and the plan was obviously to run many more focus groups but um, alas that didn't happen. Um, but, I mean, I was actually amazed that um, I reached out to a lot of the people who I met at the focus group to um, continue working with them in lockdown. Um, and I think it was actually amazing the, the amount of people who were still interested in working with me and engaging in the process um, because they felt like it was something that still needed to be dealt with. It's fantastic. I mean, it's kind of a... The, the COVID has kind of left us with a design impairment in a way. You can't go out into the world and talk to people. A bit ironic for, for your project, but you know it's it's amazing that you managed to keep so many people engaged despite not being able to go out and meet them for so long. Um, it's a, a really te a testament to what you were doing. Um, we've got a, a few questions in the chat. Um, I'll address one of them here um, from Chi Chi. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. It's a, a question for Romy. Um, she uh, Ji asks. Um, what is the most influential evidence that you found in your research um, in terms of coming up with your uh, vision of the future? So I, I suppose what influenced you to come up with the, the vision for symbiotic futures? Uh, thank you. That's a great question. Um, I think, first of all, um, the research that I did and that I wrote down in a dissertation about um, how we got disconnected from nature and then those elements of 
uh, sort of how we might improve um, and what the problem is with the climate crisis and then how if we would be connected. Uh, that was more like the first part. And then um, through uh, research into these microaerosol fungi, uh, which I did together with several experts that know a lot about this field, um, I got to know so much more about how actually these symbiotic relationships work in nature. And that was a massive influence and inspiration into this design work because um, it's a really interesting way to learn from nature and at the same time try to what we learn from nature then try to help and be also beneficial for nature as well as for human beings. I don't know if that answers your question, but I hope so. Um, actually, do you mind expanding a little bit on, on mycelia? Uh, mycel is it mycelia or mycelium? Is that the correct way to say it, the fungi? Um, I think mycelium is a mycelium. good way to say it. It's the, mycelium is the threats of the gotcha. uh, okay. fungi, and then you have the mushrooms, the fruit and bodies. And, um, Sorry, just to prompt the question a little more. We, we did a bit of work on that in New York um, when we were studying there together. Uh, do you, also, in your answer, do you mind telling uh, the audience a little bit about that work that we did there with Mycelia? Yeah, um, so there um, we had biodesign class and um, we learned about uh, that uh, mycelium is actually a really interesting building material and material to make things out of. Um, so we did experiments with uh, setting up um, sort of balls with wood chips and bits of mycelium so that it would grow into a ball, for example, in like five days. And then um, we could see um, how this kind of fluffy, soft, beautiful material, when you just bake it, have a new shape. This, so that is a really interesting thing in how things might be manufactured and how we can use biomimicry. And also to, uh, yeah, definitely learn about how we might look at nature in a different way. And what, like, because of course you did that as well in New York. Mm -hmm. How did you experience that? I, I thought it was a ton of fun. I really didn't use the mycelium for practical purposes. I ended up molding it into a tiny duck. <laughs> it's a fun material to work with. It's fascinating to kind of set something up and instead of, you know, watch it uh, dry or watch it be milled out or 3D printed, it just grows into the form that you're enticing it to grow into. It's really a, it's a beautiful experience. Um, there's a question in the chat here from Kat as well, which I think is a good one. Uh, and it's for you, Romy, it's about speculative design. She's asking as a student, are there, um, she says, is your advice to, what is your advice to students who are building speculative design projects? Ooh, that is a difficult question, uh, but a good one. Um, I think very important is to think about what you're trying to achieve and to think really broadly, because often um, when you're trying to create speculative design within um, sort of normal design institutions or studios or wherever you're doing it, um, it is really easy to go back into more traditional ways of designing and thinking about how might this thing be useful or how do you think it would be functional? And so then if you create this, what does that mean? And then um, I think it's really good to try to, yes, think about that, but also be really free and be just inspired by basically anything that comes on your path and to really think about the story that you're trying to tell through your design and what you're trying to tell people and then how you might do that in a best way. And if that is not, um, yeah, like what I think with speculative design is so great, it, it can be a lot of different things. Like it can be, you can design a, a speculative poster or a speculative plant or a speculative product or, or a speculative machine. It can be so many things. And so I think you should really try to really challenge yourself to be as broad and as uh, imaginative as possible. Fantastic. And on that note, I would also like to ask Rob. Yeah, I just have to go through <laughs> with this too. <laughs> uh, how do you balance designing speculative futures against designing utilitarian solutions? Um, I mean, that's always been a challenge for me. Uh, I'm coming from an engineering background where 
you know, much of what you're taught in engineering school is the different ways in which things fail. And so your first response whenever you're designing something as an engineer rather than as a designer, it's to look at it through the lens of what are all the risks? How does this go wrong? How does this fail? Um, and in a number of different ways, you know, how does it vibrate apart or melt or, or break under pressure or break under repeated stress? Um, and those are just the practical ways or how does the, you know, the user just fail at using this or how does it uh, not work in terms of manufacturing costs? So there's, as soon as you're thinking in engineering terms, you're thinking about the 10 million different ways, whatever you're designing can fail. Um, and designers have a, a very different view they tend to work to work, they work on creating a solution that's imperfect and then kind of fleshing it out. And they don't worry as much about the details. It's a much higher view of what a solution should be. It's more of a, a fill in the blanks type of approach. Uh, design ends up being more of a fill in the blanks type of approach um, where you create this overarching scaffolding um, and then fill it in later. Whereas engineers are, are very concerned about the details and, and often it it ends up getting you bogged down. The plus side of being an engineer and, and having that background um, and that outlook is that there are some things you know just won't work off the bat technically. And you can save yourself some time by thinking in sort of both mindsets. You aim big with design, um, but then you kind of analyze the details with engineering and make sure that what you're doing, what you're talking about is, is feasible. So, that's uh, <laughs> that's what it's like to balance those two. They feel like very opposite worlds, although they they end up working towards the same goal. Yeah, I think it's very interesting. It was always interesting as well to see you try to balance those things or balancing those things during your uh, time at GID. So I think that that was really cool. Right on. Thank you. Uh, we've got a couple of, of questions that are pretty much in the same vein here. Um, and I'll direct it towards Sophie because I think she did this especially well. Uh, there's a question from I and also from Jamie, um, and it's about COVID. Both the questions are about COVID and, and how they've forced a lifestyle change and, and how do you work under the conditions of COVID? How do you thrive under the conditions of COVID or, or even turn uh, the odds in your favor uh, when working under these conditions? Yeah, I mean, great questions. And I think something that be honest I feel like we're all still figuring out um but I think um for me I think it's what it was kind of been interesting about I mean everyone's world's being turned upside down is that you kind of there's definitely um kind of empathy that's been given and a kind of universality to everyone's world now and I feel like there's a sort of an un understanding of each other in a different way kind of cross-culturally, um, I mean, so many different ways, but I do think that um, it's, yeah, it's provided a different point of kind of conversation. I think for me, reaching out to people and going through the research process in isolation, I felt like a lot of people actually were really like rooting for you almost. Like people are really trying to help and really trying to like help people out because they know it's such a tough situation. Um, and you're kind of speaking to people and, they kind of were very engaged and very keen to kind of get involved in the process because there was this understanding that it's not an ideal situation, but it almost, I felt like it almost bridged a lot of barriers that maybe would have been kind of higher had COVID not happened. Um, but I think as well, at the same time, I think it's also highlighted a lot of different aspects in terms of um, the kind of how it's affected different people in different ways. Um, and I think that sort of, uh, I guess kind of in, in unequally, um, and you know, people who were maybe worse off to begin with are now even worse off. And I think having an understanding of that in itself is, is really important not to forget, I think as well moving forwards. And I think he'd kind of, yeah, I don't know if that's answered the question, but I think for me, there's kind of these two different things of, it both being a very like interesting learning point, but also kind of highlighting a lot of issues that maybe still need to be addressed in different ways. Thanks, Sophie. I, I've found as well too, that it, it becomes sort of an interesting universal touch point for everybody that you talk with. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, when I was talking with a bunch of different experts uh, for my final project as well, and reaching out to them by phone, it always 
became sort of the immediate topic of conversation. It was always universally applicable and everybody wants to talk about what's going on in COVID and in your own country or, or in your own situation. Um, and, and everybody's having this, it's not a perfectly universal experience. Obviously there's, people are experiencing this in different ways and, and some are experiencing tragedy and some are just staying home, but it's new and it's exciting. It becomes this cultural touch point for everyone that you can pivot off of, um, to start other conversations. And plus everybody's home right now. So getting access to, to experts has become easier. Everybody's open for a call because they're just so used to it now. It's just become a part of their life. I was going to say, if you're kind of starting out on research now, it is actually quite a good time because everyone has so much free time. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> um, let's see. We've got another question for Romy. Uh, a lot of, there's a lot of interest around this uh, around speculative design. Um, in the chat here, and it is from uh, Zhao. Let's see, question to Romy. How do you think it would change the roles of people in their lives and society? I uh, assume it's referring to your project. And, and you mentioned uh, an example of foresters as being a, an element in this speculative future that you've imagined. Are there any other examples that you can tell us about? Also interesting question. Um, I think that um, this would drastically change people's lives because the imagined future uh, is looking quite different than the way we are living right now. I think, especially with also with COVID, we can see quite some things changing in nature as well and uh, sometimes quite positive things, which is of course still not weighing up to all the negative impact, but um, I think that that is really interesting to um, see as a way on how life can be completely different. And um, um, other examples of, well, of course, yes, foresters. Um, I think also, for example, teachers or, um, well, in a lot of different jobs, actually, or positions or, um, yeah, I think it's a bit difficult question, but, um, yeah, teachers. I would go for teachers. I think that uh, there can be a very interesting, different way of educating, um, more inclusive with um, like a different uh, teaching about nature that we're not on top of nature, but inside of nature. Um, but also about how we are all humans that are all the same. How, for example, when you look at Sophie's project, I think, um, with the elements of Sophie's project, there are so many interesting things that also can be taught about or um, that you can teach more empathy towards people in different situations that do, for example, not see the things that you see. And I think that um, that is an example of what might be changing in the future, I hope. Awesome. Uh, you mentioned these uh, these changes in, in nature because of COVID. It actually reminds me of, um, it reminds me of the nature reserves that sometimes pop up around conflict zones, weirdly enough. You know, the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea. Um, yeah. That stretch of, of jungle has been reclaimed by nature and has all kinds of interesting wildlife in it now. Um, also in Colombia, uh, in areas that are, have been heavily mined, uh, not, not mined like taking ore out of the ground, mined like landmines, um, have also become kind of nature reserves as well and it's it shows this weird side to human tragedy uh, in some of these cases where when humans are collapsing in on on each other uh nature comes back in a weird sort of way yeah i think that's super fascinating as well with Chernob chernobyl 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 yes that's a good chernobyl. example as well. uh yeah it's really kind of dark and really fascinating as well and it's beautiful mm -hmm. to see how uh, resistant nature can be. It's fascinating stuff. Um, we've got another question here in the chat. I think it might be from a, a, protect, a prospective um, student for GID asking about the program a little bit. It's from Siddharth. Um, thanks for the, for the talk and, and asks us what motivation and reasoning do we have behind pursuing GID? Um, so I'll, I'll start with Sophie, but I'm sure we all have opinions on this because it's been quite a journey. Uh, 
Okay, so what was the motivation and reason behind? Okay, um, for me, it was about uh, kind of not necessarily, um, yeah, I mean, for me, I, when I started the course, it was actually more a case of do I do a master's or a PhD? And I was more interested in GID because of the, the breadth that it offered um, and the kind of ability to work cross-disciplinary. Uh, cross -disciplinary. Um, and I think for me, so my background is actually in textile design, which is so far from where I feel like I am now. Um, but I think there was there were a lot of things that I, re I was really interested in coming into the course, but I felt like it was all this kind of scattering of different ideas and interests, and I couldn't quite figure out a way to, I didn't know how I was going to link it all together and um, kind of bring my skills as a designer with these kind of very different uh, things that I was interested in. Um, and I was very interested a lot in the more science side. And so for me, the benefit of the course was um, the fact that you're kind of integrated within what is run at, at Imperial as well. Um, and so I think having the exposure and the kind of opportunity to speak with loads of uh, scientists and researchers who are so far away from what your background is, but it doesn't matter because you kind of have the shared and mutual understanding that you're kind of working towards a better future. <laughs> um, and I think it's it's a really lovely thing to be so exposed within so many different cultures and disciplines and sort of environments as well that I think it's it's really um, very unique, I would say. Uh, and yeah, a very cool opportunity that I think, well, I certainly feel very lucky to have had the opportunity to do. Um, but I mean, you guys also will have your very different reasons, so. <laughs> yeah. For me, uh, the reason is, it, it's, it's put well actually by one of our tutors. Uh, a process she calls permission giving. Um, just one moment here. I'm sorry. Um, so it's a process that uh, she calls permission giving. Layla calls permission giving. And it's this idea that she's giving permission to the students to explore and an umbrella, protective umbrella under which they can operate and, and uh, come up with interesting ideas um, and, and build and design interesting things that they they might not otherwise do. I'm coming from a very technical um, and, and sort of utilitarian background in that I was an engineer and then I was a management consultant, it's all very structured and corporate. Um, for me, GID was a two year opportunity to just take time to build and explore weird ideas um, under the guise of doing a master's degree really. Um, and sort of have that that social protection where you come out of it with an education, but it's also just been an opportunity to explore. Yeah. Romy, how about you? Um, I think uh, for me, because I have an industrial design background, which was um, about, of course, industrial design, and also quite technical, um, I was really happy with all those skills and methods that I had, but, um, Every time I, when I was doing a project, I was questioning, why am I designing this? Why do we need uh, this thing that I am designing? Whether it's a veggie slicer or a coffee machine, not that anything is wrong with that. I mean, I use them, uh, but I was wondering, like, how can I make the world a better place using all these amazing tools that I have as a designer? And so um, during GID, I really got to explore that in my own way with developing my own methods with learning a lot from everyone that also does not have a design background which opens up so much uh, space for not doing it in the usual way because everyone is doing it in their own way anyways and also getting like learning some fusion 360 from rob and talking about so many different things with sophie and then um it's like really interesting environment and i feel especially lucky that we were able to do that in this time now when you are not really able to travel that far anymore and mostly at home and it was a really life-changing experience i would say awesome um we've got a question here in the chat which is is about mimo and it's actually one that uh that i get a lot it's from cass here um, and Cass has put it especially well, but I've gotten this question in a number of different forms. Um, 
she says, you know, the plant is gorgeous, but it feels like instru instrumentalizing nature. Instrumentalizing is a very good word, actually. I don't think I've applied that to this. Um, and, and putting uh, an, an animate entity at the service of humans. And in a way, it's enslaving the plant. And I've gotten this question in a few forms of, you know, does the plant like to be touched? Are you bothering the plant? I did a lot of the development in Japan. And the question I got the most from Japanese people was, are you bothering the plant? Is it like impolite to touch the plant? Um, and I didn't, you know, it's just perhaps not built into my personality to think in those terms about a plant. And so it was surprising to see so many people have this very similar uh, reaction to Mimo and and to this, this version of a plant that's just been taken totally out of context, manipulated completely to be in the service of humans in a very sort of techno-futuristic way. Um, and it feels unnatural to people. I think I take a very different approach um, to nature than Romy does. It might even be polar opposite in, in that I, I see nature as being, well, evolution is this, I think of it as sort of a computer model that's been running for for uh, billions of years. And it's a computer optimization model, very much like the ones that you would run in actually in engineering designs. Um, but what that means is that nature can be hacked basically the, the model introduces flaws into the way that nature works because of like evolutionary pa past evolutionary reasons so that gives us an inroads into manipulating nature and you, when you use the terms hacking and manipulation and it, you're talking about living things there's a very visceral reaction to that and a very visceral negative reaction to that. But I think often that's unwarranted. You know, there's no evidence that the plant feels um, beyond, you know, just having this very mechanical response. Um, but once you start humanizing technology, and it's especially easy to humanize technology in the context of, of a natural living thing, people become attached to it and, and feel that it is its own conscious entity that is deserving of, of respect. Like it's a, a, a being in the room that, that, that just needs to be treated almost like a human. Um, and I've just never really felt that way, but it's a very good question. So thank you for asking it. Can I ask you as a follow up to that? <laughs> sure. If I, how far would you say nature then extends if like you consider yourself as a natural form, like mm. if you start adapting yourself and we then go down the route of kind of cyborgs and that aspect, would you be manipulating, would you see that as harmful or like instrumentalization as it's put? It, it depends. I think the potential for abuse is extraordinarily high once you start manipulating human beings, um, you know, being able to, when we face this dilemma in design, generally speaking, in terms of behavioral design, where you design environment or tools to manipulate a person in a certain way. But when you're directly interfacing with a, a human being, their potential for manipulation and abuse is extraordinarily high. Um, and so I'm very, I'm very concerned about that. And I should say, you know, I, I say there's a difference between humans and nature. Um, but that's really a, a, a spectrum, right? You know, you would never want to manipulate manipulate like a, a living uh, animal that is likely conscious in the same way that you're poking and prodding at this plant. You know, that would be abusive, that would be cruel. But it's just because of the plant simplicity and it's unlikely that it actually feels something that, that is causing it harm um, that allows this project to, to be, I think, morally defensible as well as tasteful. There are some researchers looking into the consciousness of plants mm -hmm. and uh, about spatial awareness and uh, really interesting actually. There's actually very fascinating research on Mimosa pudica itself um, and there's this idea that the plant might be learning from the touches and the, the research around this is very controversial, actually. There's an interesting back and forth um, in the academic world around this. But the idea is that the plant appears to, over time, if you touch it many, many, many times, it will eventually not close as rapidly. Um, and, and the idea is that it's learning that certain types of touches are, are not actually indicating that it's about to be eaten or munched on. And so it doesn't waste energy closing. 
The controversy in the research is that the some of the, the critics of this have said, actually, the research isn't well conducted. Um, and and the, the response, the, this fading response is actually just fatigue over time that the plant, the way the research is done, the, the plant is just fatiguing, it's running out of energy to be able to close as rapidly and so it doesn't. But it's a fascinating world. Um, and there's all kinds of papers written about Mimosa pedica and reinforcement learning. Let's see here, tons more questions in the chat. I think we're, we're getting um, hit a philosophical debate. Yeah, it's getting very philosophical. <laughs> uh, if I'm transhuman, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> um, let's see here. Ah, there's a question from Ben about where these projects are going in the coming years. Do you plan on continuing these? Do you plan on pushing them into the world? Are they going to become products? Um, I think that's an especially interesting question for Sophie because she's gotten tons of interest around Sensora. Uh, Johnny Ive added it to the the his selection on, on the Royal College of Art show, which was awesome to see. And, and I believe you're writing a, an article for a magazine. Have you already done that? Oh, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was, it was, yeah, just a kind of thing around, um, it was actually for the celebration of the 30th anniversary of the Disability Act in the US. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a great question. And I think, um, I think it, it kind of relates back again to actually the COVID questions as well in terms of, um, you know, I think now is a very strange time to be entering the world of, uh, yeah, I mean, work, I guess, uh, in a very broad sense. But I think it's actually, it's quite an interesting time in terms of opportunities. And I think if, I, I mean, for me, I, I definitely want to carry on the project forward if, um, if I can, and it's more about kind of finding the right form in which to take it forwards in the current climate. But I think it definitely, I think COVID is kind of, it's opened up so many opportunities that probably wouldn't have been there otherwise. And I think it's actually quite an exciting time to see if, if you can actually benefit from that um, and to kind of see it as an opportunity, as a way to work differently. And, you know, maybe it's kind of opening up all these channels with how you can work um, remotely and sort of with different people all around the world and I feel like I have no idea really what kind of form it is going to take because it's just such an open field at the moment in terms of the landscape of work but I think yeah for me definitely if, if there's the right way in which I can take it forwards I 100% would um, and I think even if it's not necessarily in the the final form that it's sort of turned into for the show and kind of for the outcome of GID, I think there's so many different elements that um, that it touches upon in terms of different themes of inclusive design and how we can actually reshape the kind of process as well as much as anything else. And I think even if um, the kind of pushing it forwards doesn't look exactly like it does now, um, there's a lot of elements that I've learned that will be, I kind of, I, I won't unlearn if that makes sense, um, which I think is great. But I mean, what, Romy, what about you? Um, yeah, I think um, similar about that everything is very different now with COVID and that it also opens up new opportunities. I would really like to take it forward, uh, but not necessarily, like I would like to vision and mission forward, but that can be in education, in um, more on like government level, that can be with, uh, different kinds of companies or institutions so I'm really looking into um, yeah different options of taking it forward in different forms and, uh, and probably trying to do multiple at the same time and um, yeah I'm not really sure yet but I'm sure that it will be something what about you Rob <laughs> well, I'm not taking Nemo forward, uh, but I am taking forward a couple of other projects which are, are in a similar vein of, I mentioned this idea of sort of hacking nature or hacking, it applies to humans as well, kind of hacking humans. Um, I'm working on a, a startup with a couple of graduates from the London Business School, um, a couple of MBAs, uh, and we're, we're creating software to help people memorize information. Um, and so creating a startup around that. Um, and then my final major project, Mimo actually wasn't my final major project, but I couldn't 
can't really mention the details for IP reasons. Uh, I've been working on a device that basically uh, tricks a person's nervous system in such a way that it can help quell panic attacks as well as uh, certain heart issues. Um, so taking that forward, that still needs a lot more research and development though. So it's kind of on the back burner for now. Um, and then also I'm working on uh, a little project on the side of my desk where I'm building uh, a robot. This is weird. Uh, I'm building a, a robot in the shape of a light bulb. I've actually got it here. This is sort of, this is one of the prototypes, but basically it could be like a nightlight for kids. On the front, there'll be a, a face here, uh, a light up face with the, this OLED screen. Um, and then these are little linear actuators in here. And so it moves in three degrees of rotation. So the face can kind of look around. Um, and the idea is that you can create a nightlight that actually has some presence for the kid. Um, so it feels like there's sort of another entity in the room to, to help them sleep, like a friendly presence instead of just like most nightlights are just, okay, it's a little bit brighter. So maybe you don't look out. And, you know, when you're a kid, you see the, the towel hanging on the rack and it looks like a ghost and you see, you know, the reflection coming off the clock and it looks like eyes staring at you. The idea with this is to kind of have this sort of um, watchful, friendly presence in the room to, to look after you when you're a little kid to help you sleep. Um, but anyway, just taking all those projects forward uh, simultaneously because I, I can't say no to working on too many things. <laughs> Um, I have a question with one of, like with those projects since this talk is also about humanizing technology are there any aspects within those designs that you particularly look at how you might humanize those technologies yeah actually this robot this light bulb robot project is a good example I was working on its face the other day let me show you actually um, and so here's some animations I've been putting together it's still not perfect yet but let me see if it's going to work. It kind of looks around and then its eyes get bigger and smaller and it blinks if it's behaving. Except I don't think it's doing anything right now. But the idea is that you can create a very, a very, um, let's say anthropomorphized object with even very simple visuals. And the cues to take are from animation, actually. Animators have figured this out long before designers ever have, about how to anthropomorphize um, and, and give character and life to something that's inanimate and just shouldn't, shouldn't exist in that same way. Um, so that's been a source of inspiration. Yeah, super interesting. Um, there's a question from Kat about, you know, what designers, what artists are inspirational to the work that we're doing? Um, does one of you in particular want to take that instead of just throwing it out there? Um, oh, yes, yeah, so you start. <laughs> I mean, I think for me, um, I think a lot of the time my main inspiration doesn't really come well it does come from artists and designers but I think for me I'm I just have this weird fascination with the brain and um I think I'm just fascinated with all these things um sort of that go that well relating back to the topic in terms of that that go beyond being human um and actually in mentioning the cyborgs earlier that was actually where a lot of the research that I uh did spend I spent a lot of time looking at kind of how you can go transhuman and kind of develop these sort of uh, kind of new ways of feeling and perceiving and kind of creating this extra sense and I was very much looking at how cyborgs kind of adapt their bodies and augment their physical being to create um, these kind of superhuman abilities in a way um, so I think for me that would probably be my biggest inspiration or interest <laughs> um yeah i don't know what about you Romy? um yeah i think most of it like i already said comes from nature but if i have to name some designers i think that superflux studio is doing really interesting things and uh, alexandra daisy ginsburg is doing really interesting work and i also get inspired by people that are not designers or artists, like for example, Jane Goodall, or people that are trying to achieve similar 
goals or have similar visions, but in very different areas of work. And I think that um, within my design, I most likely uh, head towards totally different fields or dive into totally different kind of science that I don't know that much about, but try to learn as much as possible and that that has been most inspiring and useful for my design than to look at other designers work which is of course also very interesting what about you rob for me i'm i'm kind of a sucker for the classic of dieter rams i've always found his work to be um interesting in that in that uh, very minimal sort of way where everything's very clean and very intentional um but Again, that maybe comes back to my personality. The other, the other source of inspiration, the other designer that I love to look at his work is um, Buckminster Fuller, in that sort of retro futuristic view of the world. Um, you know, his drawings are just fascinating. His design work is just fascinating, and it's interesting to see how people per perceive the future from a different time. And it's really inspiring, and it's it's humbling as well too, because then you look at your own designs and go hold on, I'm probably wrong about everything. <laughs> but, you know, it's uh, it, it's just brilliant to look at. Um, I think we'll wrap it up in a second here. Uh, it's been it's been almost an hour. It's been lovely to chat with both of you, Romy and, and Sophie. Um, if there's any last questions in the chat, uh, type them out now and we'll, we'll give you 20 seconds. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, I'll give uh, Romy and Sophie a chance to sort of say a closing comment and uh, we'll sign off here. Um, why don't we start with you, Sophie? Is there anything that you'd just like to add at the end of the conversation? Uh, I mean, I feel like we could carry on just sort of <laughs> to answer sort of random questions that, all day. But, um, oh God, questions coming in. Um, uh, well, yeah, we can just play. <laughs> um yeah yeah we'll just carry on but um yeah i mean i think uh i would say go and check out the rest of the show online while it's still there because i mean i think actually it's the benefit of it being online is that you can see so many different uh disciplines that i like i probably wouldn't have found um physical show before so i feel like it's actually a great opportunity to go and sort of see the diversity that um of what people have created and especially in such um sort of diverse uh yeah strange times it's quite amazing to see what people have come up with so i would recommend getting at uh getting online to that and then also yeah get in touch if you have any questions or any thoughts that you want to share right on so before we go to Romy's closing remarks, we had a bunch of, of questions come in in the chat. Uh, I'll answer the easy one first, which is what is the name of that retro futuristic artist? Uh, he's more of a retro futuristic engineer, um, but but has created beautiful drawings around his work. It's uh, Buck Minister Fuller, um, worth checking out. And um, there's a question here again, which is repeated. And I'm realizing I accidentally ignored it. So sorry, uh, Nayun. Uh, it's a question for Romy. Uh, and she talks about how signals between trees can be detected. Uh, how exactly can these signals be distinguished? Like, what are the warning signs against aphid attacks that uh, were mentioned? Hmm. Interesting question. Um, well, I don't know specifically which elements show this aphid attacks. I know that um, it is certain chemicals. Uh, that they research and they track in um, the lab. They can do DNA research or um, connect quantum dots to the molecule so that they can uh, see um, where the chemicals go. And um, there is a research paper about this actually, and uh, I'm happy to send it to you if you want to learn more about it. Um, and I don't know specifically which... Uh, which one, like which chemical or which signal it is that shows this uh, specific attack? Sorry for a bit of a vague answer, probably. Right on. Uh, thank you. There's one last closing question here as well, too, and it's from Jamie. Um, and I'm sure we'll all have very different answers for this because I think every designer has a different, uh, different answer to this. But she asks, um, What's your process when you get a new idea? How do you evaluate whether or not it's worth pursuing? Um, Sophie, why don't you take that one? Gosh. I mean, I, 
yeah I don't know I think I mean well my process when I get any idea is I feel like I, to be honest I feel like a lot of it to know whether to explore it or not is in your gut and you kind of get a feeling about it and that for me is just I just follow what I feel is um whether it's interesting me enough um because I feel like most of the time if you don't have enough interest in it yourself you won't have the steam to carry the the kind of idea all the way through to developing it to a product or you know whatever it becomes um but I think yeah I think for me I I, I often I just talk to people to be honest that would be what my first step is I I kind of just reach out and have a lot of different conversations with a lot of different uh people and just see different ways in which people react depending on which perspective they're coming at the topic from um and trying to sort of gauge an understanding of where where the idea sits or where it sort of um might sort of be most useful or sort of yeah I think definitely I I would say I that would be my kind of instinct uh would be to speak to people way beyond uh the knowledge that I have who are probably more far more expert in the area than myself um and trying to get an understanding that way awesome I think that that point of contextualization is really important. Um, for me, that's that's how I always start, is if I've come up with an idea, it's usually within the context of having a conversation with somebody, or maybe it's even in a vacuum where you just think of something and go, oh, that's kind of interesting, or you're reading something and inspires uh, a new idea. For me, the first step is always contextualization. So it's reading you know, where does this idea sit within the realm of other ideas? First of all, is, is the idea original? You know, you might think of something that you think is brilliant and then you just Google it and it's been done 10 million times in 50 different ways that are better than, than you thought of. So that's always a challenge and that happens probably at least 50% of the time when you come up with a new idea. Um, but then you, you try to find the context, you know, what other projects or uh, pieces of work are similar or parallel um, so that you can then kind of take ideas from those uh, similar or parallel projects, but also it allows you to define your lane and understand what makes your work different. So that's that's always the place where I start. What about you, Romy? Um, I think for me, it never really starts with a new idea and then it, or maybe it is a new idea, but then I come up with like a hundred different ideas to sort of explore this area and to explore new things because for me it doesn't really work when I like I get ideas but those are like small solutions or small things that I come up with something but when I do this kind of design that I like to do most I it doesn't work for me to just come up with an idea and it never happens to at least not for me uh, I have to like do like a hundred ideas and then do like 10 different maps and brainstorm sessions and like it takes a really long time to get from something that is interesting and that I get really excited about but I don't know exactly what it is and then it takes all this process to figure out what I'm actually so excited about and to try to find um, that sort of direction and I think um, the evaluation part is uh, Partly talking to other people, talking to experts, talking to professors, talking to, well, that are experts actually. Um, and also um, looking at what you are excited about. Because I also quite trust on my own instinct for taking something forward. Of course, if you are more uh, into what's a different process of bringing it to business, you might also want to do a lot of user testing and stuff like that to evaluate. Um, but yeah, I think um, it's interesting how the three of us has quite different processes. Mm -hmm. and, and the thing is, what's fascinating about this too is if you lined up 10 different designers, they probably mostly have very different processes. I think that uh, a lot of the view of design that's gotten out in the world thanks to companies like IDEO, for example, is that there's this very structured design thinking process that you follow and that's what every designer does and that's how it's done. Um, and in many cases, there's great ideas coming out of, of those structured processes. But what you'll find is that every designer has their own twist on it. Um, and every designer makes judgment calls depending on the type of project that they're developing to 
to change that process. Um, and so it's not as structured as as, um, <clears throat> as people end up thinking, I think. So uh, thanks everyone for your questions. Uh, let's get some closing comments from, from Romy as well. Is there anything that you'd like to add to the conversation before we, we leave it? Uh, I think it was uh, very lovely to talk to you. Thank you for hosting it, Rob, and thank you, Sophie. Uh, it was wonderful that people gave so many comments. And uh, if anyone is interested, I would love to talk. So please email or contact me in any way. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope that it was inspiring or interesting. And uh, thank you very much. Fantastic. Um, I'll just close out as well, too. So I just want to thank Gabby, who's been in the background helping us with the screen and helping us set this up. And, and she's just been on top of all of this and making and showing your comments all on the screen so we can discuss them as well too. Um, and, and thank you all for coming. It's really awesome to see so many people from the design world, the design community come out and be interested in, in events like this. Uh, it's a pleasure to share what we've learned. So really appreciate you all being here. And uh, we'll leave it at that. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you. Bye now.